Welcome, everyone. Uh, I know everybody here, so, but thank you guys for coming out on a, fr on a Friday afternoon. Like I said, this will be very casual and fairly short, and I just want it to be conversational and open some questions. Uh, so thanks to Ben and Katie, who's not here, but for inviting me. And basically what I want to talk about today is the topic here, and I just want to point it out because the topic that went out on the listserv was called an introduction to oral history. And this will not be an introduction to oral history. This will just be sort of a set of loosely structured thoughts and questions about this field of oral history and how it's changing with digital tools. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, okay, so we just a brief review for anyone who's not familiar. Uh, oral history as a field has is about a I don't know, 75, 80 years old. Uh, of course, our species has always shared oral stories, you know, word of mouth tales. This goes back a long way in human evolution. Uh, but typically we say oral history really only counts those things that are verbatim recorded using audio devices in some way. Uh, so even like 19th century accounts to tr write, tr write down, you know, what people remembered about Abraham Lincoln right after he died or something are closely related, but a little bit different. So it's really kind of like a mid-century, 20th century thing. Uh, and here's two pioneering early ventures in oral history. On the left is the Columbia University oral history program, really the first university-based oral history program in the United States. Uh, pioneered by the famous U.S. historian Alan Nevins. Not pictured here, neither of these guys is Alan Nevins, but I wanted to have these two Alans things, so I you know, wanted to make sure he got in there. Uh, Alan Nevins was focused on high politics, so his idea was to go and interview politicians, Supreme Court justices, people like that, people of, well, of power and influence, and get the kind of behind-the-scenes take. Uh, and he did that using... Uh, the reel-to-reel -reel recorders that were available at the time, magnetic tape reel-to-reel -reel recorders. Uh, and he was building on an older tradition. You can see there on the right, uh, this is, of course, the famous folklorist Alan Lomax uh, doing one of his many, many, many field recordings that he did all throughout the country, uh, most famously in the South, recording the famous folk singers like Lead Belly, uh, later on Woody Guthrie, people like that. Uh, so this idea of like taking fairly early audio recording devices, field recorders, in most cases like magnetic reel-to-reel -reel tapes, out into the field and like recording the people uh, was sort of the origin point for oral history. And so oral histories are about 80 years old or so. And it, honestly, the field has always been kind of intertwined with the technologies that we use to do the recording. So there's really nothing new here. Uh, but in recent years, with in recent decades really, as digital technologies have swept through all kinds of different fields and really reshaped media, uh, audio and video, uh, oral history is one of many fields that I think is kind of grappling with some of these changes. And this is actually part of a larger reckoning that I think the discipline of history is having, and here's just one quote that highlights this uh, from digital historian Tim Hitchcock says, you know, history as a discipline largely uninvolved in the production of digital resources and apparently uninterested in changing how it illustrates its scholarship to accommodate the digital has put its head in the sand and tried to ignore the whole issue. Now, obviously, Hitchcock is kind of skeptical, uh, saying that historians as a discipline have not done very much uh, in terms of changing their practices. He's talking about, like, you know, how many uh, illustrations do you cite to prove a thesis? or some really foundational stuff that seem to be more up for grabs uh, recently than they, ha than they were for many decades. So this is not, oral history is not unlike other uh, aspects of history in this way. And I thought what I would do today is talk about the oral history process uh, as I think about it, sort of start to finish, but then also trying to talk about how uh, digitization and the digital revolution is reshaping oral history, or raising some interesting questions at every stage of this, uh, of the oral history process. And we're going to talk about from like, you know, big picture project planning, interview preparation, the interview itself, processing those interviews, and archiving and dissemination. And as I always tell my students, I say, look, I say, you know, look, the interview itself is just one small piece of this whole process. A lot of the work goes in before, and a lot of the work happens afterwards. Um, but just keep this chart in mind, because we'll keep going through it. 
And uh, I'll also say I wouldn't be doing my job as a historian of technology if I didn't make a little caveat against technological determinism. This is the belief, of course, that you know, new technologies are like billiard balls and all of a sudden like this digital thing shoots in like a, bolt, like a billiard ball from left field and everything changes in response to that. Uh, and that's never really the way it works with any technology. And I put up there a, a, the banner for the Shoah Foundation, a project many people probably know about, an effort to record as uh, remembrances, oral histories, if you will, from as many uh, victims of the Holocaust as possible. I think at last count they've recorded over 58,000 oral histories as part of that project. Uh, that project started in the early 90s, predating many of the digital issues that we're thinking of today, but I think r ran into some of the same things. So I guess the point is just that a lot of these changes that we now ascribe to like the digital revolution, honestly were changes that were coming about in some case, in many cases before sort of digital stuff hit. And digital technologies have exacerbated or complicated some of them, but it's not as though like oral historians were doing our thing in, in a totally unchanging way and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, digital and everything has to change. And I think it's actually really easy when we talk about digital stuff to get in that mindset of thinking like it was all settled and then all of a sudden this new technology has changed everything. And that's honestly just never the way it works, right? There's all kinds of changes that, there's, there's a lot of continuities and changes there as well. And these earlier technologies had all kinds of changes as well. I mean, the change from early magnetic reel to reel record, recorders to you know, plastic micro cassette recorders allowed head changes and things like that as well. So uh, like I said, I want to kind of go through and just honestly raise some questions about how digita digitization is affecting oral history at each stage. And the most complex of these is probably at the first stage, which is project planning, where many of the big picture, high level decisions get made about uh, an oral history project. And I just put up there sort of a brain dump of some things that I have thought about a little bit as we think about oral history projects in this digital era. First is, you know, what is the scale of this project going to be? Uh, costs have declined somewhat, especially on the actual technology side. Getting recorders into people's hands is cheaper than ever. The recording medium itself is cheaper than it's ever been. That is to say, to record X hours of audio or video costs a lot less than it used to and you used to have to account for the tapes and things like that. Uh, so many projects have simply become larger. People interview, there's more hours of recordings that are done, uh, more, inter, more narrators are interviewed, things like that. So I think when we plan these projects, people sort of have bigger scale in mind oftentimes than they would have 20, 30 years ago. Uh, where you might have, I mean, I mean, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, people proposed NEH project to, projects to the NEH where they say like, hey, I'm gonna interview 35 people or something like that. And today, people would kind of shrug their shoulders at that and say that's not really thinking broadly enough to merit you know, support or something like that. Uh, but with that bigger scale comes a host of other questions and issues, and we'll come back to that later on. Also, speed. Uh, you know, an interview can be posted to the web literally hours after it's recorded. Or, I mean, if you really want to push the edge of this, people can like go on Facebook Live and live stream their oral history or something like that. That would be a bad idea, I think, in most cases. But sort of the time lag between you know, when the interview is conducted and when it's sort of disseminated has been radically compressed. Uh, it used to be a case that Alan Lomax would be out in the field for months driving around with his brother in their, you know, in their car. Uh, and maybe a year or two later, those tapes would be available in the Library of Congress or something like that. But now, of course, we've radically compressed that. And that raises all kinds of other issues and questions as well. Uh, questions of copyright and intellectual property have become a lot more complex on the web. This is not limited to oral histories. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in, it's pretty settled in intellectual property law that in, oral histories are copyright, uh, the narrator owns the copyright of those at the moment of creation. Uh, and standard practice had always been for the narrator when the interview was over to sign a deed of gift, to deed their copyright over to the archive or repository that was going to hold them. Uh, it's simply become more complicated though because as we all know from the web, once you start posting things to the web, controlling where they go from there becomes a lot harder slash impossible. 
Uh, so I think this is something that especially libraries and archives have had to really kind of grapple with, that they, the ability to kind of control what happens to things they post has lessened quite a bit. And oral historians are grappling with this as well. I have shifted over in the past few years to a Creative Commons licensing uh, system in which uh, the narrator retains copyright but grants us a grants the repository or project a use license uh, pr under Creative Commons, uh, particularly the share alike attribution 4.0. I always forget the exact version of it yeah. that we use. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we've always done non-commercial, although I've read interestingly some recent debates saying that that is that that might be worth dropping as well, um, and that there's a lot of commercial ventures out there that are doing useful stuff or things with it. But so it's become really complex, I think. Um, and I'm happy to share that if anybody wants to see what those forms look like, just send me an email and I could share with you what they look like. Um, questions of audio versus video are a lot more complex. Uh, the standard had always been kind of doing audio only interviews. And because honestly, doing video oral history interviews prior to about a decade ago was technically a little bit forbidding for many people and just involves such a radical increase in cost uh, and personnel time to get a videographer, to set up lighting, things like that, that it simply, you know, that was not the default. That is no longer really the case. So now this question of like, do you add video to it uh, is a much more open-ended question. Some people say yes, absolutely, because you can and it's easy. Uh, I personally am in the camp of, um, I think the tote bag sums up my own position better. I'm in the never <laughs> pivoting to video <laughs> phase. I really find some interest, in, I find the sort of audio only spoken word tradition to be a really powerful one and an important genre unto itself. Um, but we're in the middle of this so-called pivot to video that everyone talks about uh, wherever possible. So those questions are up for grabs as well. And then more big picture, the web's kind of this participatory or democratic culture of the web, although I think in recent years that even that's become sort of muddied as like a few five big companies have taken over most of the web and things like that. But uh, people have new expectations that they want to participate in big projects like this. Uh, the old school oral histories used to be kind of very much a, you know, we go out and get the information and we store it in the archive so it sits in a box or something like that. And increasingly, I think, in, the, in a sort of social media infused web 2.0 uh, self-documentary culture, people want to participate in new ways. They want to see it more quickly. They want to be able to comment on it, to share it, to remix it. So some of those older practices that were much more curator, curator intensive and a little bit more author, uh, authoritative, the curator sort of held on to a lot more of that historical or curatorial authority. I think a lot of that has loosened up whether you like it or not and how to kind of grapple with that becomes a real challenge for us as oral historians and librarians and archivists. Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions about that, I guess? What questions do you guys have at this stage, <laughs> at this project phase? I, one one um, topic that I feel comes up from time to time in project planning is IRB. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there, there's you know documentation out there and there are communities out there that feel that oral histories are exempt yep. from a lot of the IRB considerations. Um, and, but there are also, there, there's out there, others out there who find that problematic because a lot of the same issues of um, exposure or um, like, you know, participant consent mm -hmm. can kind of come up. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't have an answer. I don't just come down firmly on one. I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit conflicted about complete exemption from IRB, but I also realize that most IRB processes that we deal with now are like ill-suited to the kind of work yeah. we do. Um, and very, you know, complicating, and they can slow work down and even um, dissuade new new um, historians from even wanting to become involved in this kind of work. Yeah, it can really turn them off. So that's so I feel like that even comes up with the planning as well. Mm -hmm. I know it trickles into the interview, of course, and what happens after the interview. But yeah, yeah. So you can use, you use IRB for all of yours, right? For the university. Of Not anymore. No, oral history is exempt. <laughs> we are now exempt. As of oh, like a couple two, months ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a year or two ago. So the, the federal guidance changed, I think, like two years ago. Um, the overarching federal guidance re removed oral history and other kind of journalistic interview-based practices 
uh, and left it up to the discretion of individual campuses. And I think just a couple months ago, we got that email from IRB saying oral histories are no longer yeah. um, under oh, IRB's under purview. Our, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jason. I have a question for the talk, Introduction to Oral History. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's another day. That's I, I just wanted to ask about, um, because I don't use oral histories in my research, my research is almost entirely text or, or images, and none of them are photographic, and obviously not video mm -hmm. uh, or audio, which, when historians use oral history, which is considered um, the source if they have, let's say, an audio and a transcription? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, which, when historians are going to uh, oral histories, do they find a more compelling source? And let me just put my cards on the table. It, it seems to me that the transcription is first, today, more searchable, and it's colder, it's more analytical, the, mm -hmm. the, the historian's relationship with it is more analytical, whereas the audio or video would allow for a kind of empathetic, empathetic move mm -hmm. that you can, you can gauge perhaps emotions better than you can in the, in the transcription. So I'm just curious how you found as an oral historian, how historians who use oral histories as primary sources, what their, what their relationship with the different ways in which it can be pervaded is. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and honestly, my take is, my sense is that oral historians have debated that issue constantly for like half a century now, uh, with no particular resolution to it. The transcript remains sort of fixed, so if you have to cite something, you know that when someone goes back to it, it will look exactly the same, and there will be no debate over interpretation. But other people hold that up as a problem, right? Because two people, right. even the same audio clip, can be interpreted quite differently. That's to right. give you, I mean, an illustration, there's, there's a, a good illustration of this that's come up a lot over, you know, a big historical question about, like, what was President Lyndon Johnson's attitudes towards uh, civil rights, the civil rights movement, right? Crucial player in passing uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it really came down to how they transcribed uh, all sorts, how his, T talks got, or how his uh, tapes got transcribed in many cases, Did they right? Did information, you mean? Or well, yeah, for example, I mean, like, he has a strong southern accent, and, you know, he often was, the transcripts, the official transcripts translate him saying uh, the term Negro. But it actually, when you listen to him, a lot of people said it sounds a lot closer to the N-word, what he's actually saying. And this becomes a very different shading, right, on what you think is going on here. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's a real issue, uh, that if you fi get 10 oral historians in a room, you'll probably get two, five, you know, t not 10 different opinions, but no consensus on and, it. And oral historians are producing or they're collecting primary sources. When historians use oral histories, do you find they tend to use transcriptions? Or there isn't there any general yeah. rule for, for the no. non-oral historian using oral histories? In, in general, people will use the transcript. Uh, because, like you said, in the past, it's been a lot more searchable, although that is changing a little bit. It's just honestly a lot faster, right? And in the course of, if I have a 90-minute oral history interview and I'm in the archive, I can get through that. It's going to take me 90 minutes to listen to it, whereas I can read six interview transcripts in that time. So, you know, the oral historians have always debated this, but honestly, when you really look at practice, what's happening when historians use those in the archives, they have primarily used the transcript. Uh, but the, the, the flip side of that would be like documentary, documentarians, multimedia producers, you know, they're the opposite. They've always gone for the kind of emotional punch of the audio or video We're source itself. We're trying to build a transcription system that captures as much of that as possible. Yeah. And I, there's no like science Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, other people have gone more towards the sort of the, the route that uh, almost a linguistic type yeah. thing, right? Trying to capture intonations and things like that. So. It depends yeah. on the purpose of the person. And I, and I, I, I carry the, the National Time Jazz Archive of History, and we've had, public, we've had authors come and use them. Um, and yes, they tend to go with the transcript first, but then if they're serious about it, they often will want to listen to the audio and, and queue up to the point. They identify the places that they're interested in, and they, and they queue it up to hear mm -hmm. as well. And, and when you add the visual, then you can also add, you can, you can determine yourself the nonverbals that you can't capture with the audio. Yeah. So uh, 
I think as the 21st century progresses, we're going to see more video captured. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's it opens kind of a whole Pandora's box of of questions, right? Um, Anyways, and back to the IRB one. I mean, in general, I'm a fan of, uh, I, I'm happy to not have to fill out all those IRB forms every time I teach the class. Uh, but I mean, I think there still is a crucial need to talk a lot about ethics, right? Uh, so the Oral History Association right now is redoing its sort of best practices overarching guideline statement uh, along these lines, right? To say actually we need a more robust discussion of oral history ethics now that we're out from IRB approval. I mostly hate the IRB process. I go through it all the time because when I, the work I'm doing is not exactly oral histories. The one thing the IRB that is, I find valuable is it forces me to create a kind of standard script that I must then explain to my whoever interviewees, subjects, participants, whoever you want to call them, different fields have different kind of terms, explain to them in a, in a language that they can deal with what it is I'm doing with them and what their, what their Role is and what they're allowed to do, yeah. you know, to the extent to which they can just back away, especially yeah. in areas where I work with people who deal a lot with being oppressed or, or minority groups, where mm -hmm. they, you know, especially with colonial histories and yeah. everything. Yeah. So that's the one aspect of IRB I always like is that need to go ahead and say, here's here's what I would like to do with you, and yeah. here's how I'll use it, and you're allowed to just walk away mm -hmm. from any of this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think. I certainly, and I think most oral historians would say that informed consent still remains absolutely crucial, right? That sense that everyone knows yeah, exactly they what they're doing, how it's going to be used, yeah. all that kind of stuff remains absolutely crucial. Uh, the big issues where oral historians got really hung up with IRB is the request that uh, we anonymize stuff, yeah, which just we don't do in oral history. I mean, it, it becomes useless as a historical source once you do that. So we never did, but I had to fill out the forms every year saying like, we will not anonymize any of this. Uh, and even if you wanted to, you couldn't because you're asking for, you know, when were you, when were you born, who were your parents, this kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's silly. And also the sense that you have to avoid questions that might cause psychological harm. Uh, that is one thing where I think oral historians, we think of ourselves in some ways closer to like journalists in terms of speaking to the record. So, you know, would you not ask someone from the Bu first Bush administration, or the second Bush administration about like the Iraq war because like they might feel bad about it, yeah, I right? Yeah, problems with the earthquake, pro the Nepal earthquake yeah. project. So I had to add all this extra language in like, how do you feel about me asking you these questions? Yeah. Are you upset now? Like this kind yeah. of like, and you can imagine in a case where you're speaking to like, you know, officials who might have, you know, taken bribes to, on the building code or something like, there's a need to speak to the historical record and like, yeah, they might feel bad that their decisions killed a lot of people mm -hmm. like in the aftermath, but do we really care? Do we want to prioritize yeah. that sense over getting the truth of the record on tape? Of course, of course it's important to get capture that, but then how it's disseminated and what time it's released to the public. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we'll, I'll move forward so we get closer to that. Uh, I meant to finish this slide and didn't, so here it is. Uh, but okay. in terms of interview preparation, uh, a lot of that remains the same. We do our, try and do your research as best you can about the person. The one way it's changed for me, honestly, is as more and more local history sources have been digitized, uh, I've gotten a lot more information. So for example, I typically now for local, type, most of my oral history stuff is based here in the US and quite local. Uh, I find articles about people like in the Edwardsville Intelligencer and the Alton newspaper and things like that. And uh, I was hoping we'd have more library staff here because I want to make my one pitch how much we would love to have a newspapers.com subscription. Uh, our students are using it all the time. And, uh, we're retiring right now, so they're having campus visits or something like that. We're trying to hire as many as we can. Yeah, so I think they're caught up in that today. Yeah. yeah, so no, totally fine. But uh, let them know. We are, the problem is it just doesn't go back very far. It doesn't capture much local stuff. Local yeah, uh, newspapers.com honestly has emerged as the really uh, good source because they have the full text digitized, like the Edwardsville the Intelligencer. Features. Yeah, clipping feature. Uh, I've brought it up with Matt Paris before. The problem is it's, as I understand, it's disseminated. You know, you can get an individual license for like 140 bucks a year uh, but the institutional license is through ProQuest, and it's mm -hmm. on a on a newspaper on a by newspaper basis, and it's like thirty thousand dollars for full access. Uh, yeah, uh, publishers are good at squeezing every dollar out of the yeah. digital ecosystem, right? Yeah. Uh, if we jump forward to the interview itself, 
Um, cheap digital audio recorders have really, I mean, have, have, I mean, I think this is an area where digitization has made some big changes, right? To get fret what used to be considered broadcast quality audio is pretty easily available. Here's a setup in which you can capture really high quality video with just a smartphone and this funky little device, right? With uh, audio and lights and things like that. I mean, what used to, what, you know, even, 15 years ago would have been thousands of dollars worth of lighting and audio and video equipment is now this weird little thing you can hold in your hand uh, and capture it on the same thing you use to play Candy Crush or Fruit Ninja or something like that, right? Um, so this has really changed uh, the dynamic in terms of how we think about oral histories. I think I brought it in. When I, first, I'm, I like to think of myself as not that old, but when I started doing oral histories, it was with this guy, a little Olympus, and this had the little... Uh, um, you guys maybe remember these, thinking of a historical artifact, the miniature little tape, right? Um, and the audio quality on these things was terrible, but you could fit them in your pocket. And There's a recording of the gears of the Olympus. Yeah, exactly, right. They, they tear yeah, yeah they're, hard to, they're hard to manage. They don't hold up very well. Uh, but they were widely used for a long time, not in professional level settings, but out in the field for like basic dictation and field recording and things like that because they were cheap, they were widely available, things like that. Um, yeah, very portable. The batteries lasted a long time. Uh, and now, you know, I typically do this with some sort of task cam recorder like this, not much bigger, but able to record broadcast level stuff. And especially if you start to hook up external microphones to it, we'll take XLR connections and things like that. Uh, and honestly, even smartphones have really put these kind of very high quality digital recorders in people's pockets. I, that's honestly the biggest change for teaching oral history in recent years is I used to sort of be always, you know, spend a lot of time in class steering students into certain technologies. And honestly, now they mostly just do the class recordings on their smartphones. And it's okay. They do pretty well. The biggest issue, honestly, is transferring the files off of their smartphone is usually where they get some sort of hang up and I get last minute emails, panicked emails. Um, and as I'd already mentioned, I think you know, video is no longer prohibitively expensive or technolo technically forbidding. So this question of like, will you do video is no longer a question of like, well, you know, the default used to be no unless you had an extravagant budget or some particular reason why you wanted to capture that. And now I think it's actually a different choice that gets made at the outset, right? Of why, you know, if you choose not to do video, why not? Why are you not doing video? Invasive languages program in the UK, and you have to explain why not now. Mm -hmm. it, used to, it used to be the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, that is kind of a, something that has changed, partly just because the technology has become so much more accessible. Can I mention? Oh, yeah. Besides yeah. Tascan, which is wonderful, Zoom, the Zoom yeah. H2N is an excellent use. Um, mm -hmm. We use that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple different brands out there now of like very affordable, accessible, very high quality uh, um, recorders out there. And, you know, within very soon is really, I think, going to be on the smartphone side, right? You can actually get additional uh, microphones that plug into your smartphone because that's the downside is always the limitation is usually on the microphone side. Um, so I suspect, you know, when we come back and have this in five years and we're talking about like oral history holograms or something like that. Yeah. Um, the Shoah Foundation is actually trying to go to a hologram-based system. Um, so, I mean, it's Spielberg behind it, so of course, right? He's been working on holograms for a long time. Um, the interview processing stage. Uh, this has changed as well. I, I think one of the things that I have been really struck by recently is how much temptation there now is to start editing those audio files right away. Uh, my students in oral history classes, I'm always surprised how many of them are already familiar with basic audio editing through things like Audacity, uh, you know, sort of processing on the software side. And I have to be very careful with them to say, don't start editing the original audio. We need to keep some version of the original source itself. Uh, and inevitably, some students are like, well, I went in and cut out all the parts where they, you know, were just wasting time, or I cut out all the other stuff. I'm like, no, don't cut that stuff out, right? You have to save one sort of original source thing. This is where my you know, old school historian archivist sense is. We need one raw original source that remains unchanged. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this problem is only going to get worse in some ways, right? Because the temptation is to just start you know, cleaning it up a little bit immediately upon recording. Bring me in. I'll talk to you. 
same oh yeah, do you have the same issue? Uh, yeah, well, linguists don't want to clean it up. First right. of all. So I can come in and make the case for why the mess that they want to clean up is so critically important. Mm -hmm. so, and also so. use waves, save it as a wave yep. file. Yeah. So that's yeah, so I, uh, I'll lean on both of you to come in and keep making that case. But yeah, it never used to come up, right? And all of a sudden, in the past few times when I've been teaching classes, students will they'll have Audacity on their laptops, and they'll be like, well, I just I thought I might clean it up a little bit. Like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Um, well, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> and uh, transcription has also become faster, perhaps. Uh, the, 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 the stereo type of oral history projects is that they get backlogged at the transcription phase. Um, oral history, I should say, you know, in general, oral historians have always tried to produce transcripts. This is not the case for every interview-based discipline. Um, but oral historians, we have, have generally always tried to produce full verbatim transcripts, and this is time and labor intensive. Uh, there's been hope that a direct text to uh, I'm sorry, voice to text technology is around the corner, but that hope has also been there for like 15 years now, right? People have been saying, we're just around the corner. We're gonna just, you know, it's gonna go straight from voice to text. I mean, look at what Siri does when you try to talk into the iPhone. She butchers yeah. your message, so I'm, I'm on the skeptical side of that. Oh, man, I was look. hoping. <laughs> look, that's why I came to this. <laughs> I was hoping you were gonna be like, I do, here's such a I do know of software. And then subscribe, subscribe. I do know of a piece of software I would be happy to show you guys another time, which does dramatically cut back uh, the transcription process. And maybe you're already familiar with it. It's called Elan, E-L-A-N. It's free, it works on Macs, it works on PCs. E-L-A-N? E-L-A-N. So type in E-L-A-N trans transcribing or something. Okay. It's free to download. Um, and it, you know, for, for language documentation, it's our friend. Because yeah. uh, in addition, because our documentation work often involves um, multiple like, linguistic pre-translations as well as what we call morpheme interlinearization. So that's capturing the parts of speech, the grammatical mm -hmm. categories. We often, our transcribing involves four, five, six, seven, eight tiers. And if we have video, oftentimes people are trying to capture a gesture as well, mm. and eye gaze. <sighs> so all of these tiers are hugely time consuming. Yeah. And so Elon is a piece of software that still requires that you be in there to listen and type. However, it really automates a lot of the other process. It's super easy. I would be happy to give a workshop on it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. There are, there yeah, I mean, even for basic transcription, there are some nice software yeah. packages that, that we use a lot, like Otranscribe and the free one. Expressscribe is one I use. It's a little bit older, but works well. I have like the foot pedal for it. You control the audio with your foot pedal. Uh, same things used in like medical transcriptions work and things like that. Uh, ben and I have been playing around this past summer. We played around with Amazon released its transcribe service. You basically upload the original audio file up to the Amazon um, cloud storage and you pay, it's a paid service, but it's really cheap. I think like an hour of transcription costs like $4 or something like that. Um, and it was... I'm trying to, it wasn't an unqualified success. It's the same technology that's used in uh, Alexa. Uh, but it spits back a, you know, a wall of text, undifferentiated, not broken out by speaker or anything like that. But it got most of it right. Were you yeah. working with what we might think of as standard, average? Yeah. Language? That is a problem. Yeah. The moment you get it. Yeah. Yes. yes. Regional. It, it gets better. Well, yeah. standard and white. Yeah, white. Yeah. Standard. Yeah. yeah. standard. yeah. Yeah, well, because they've used their machine learning to, you know, on their yeah. Western customer base, right? It's like, how, how much is a pizza? Yeah. Barbara, <laughs> you would earn extra money by going in and talking to computers yeah. and teaching them to recognize your voice. Yeah. So I yeah. bring home an extra 25 or 30 bucks a week. By oh, yeah. I mean, I will say, it seems like the technology on that is advancing really quickly. I think largely because of the podcast revolution. Right? To get metadata for all this audio that's now being created, a lot of tech firms are throwing a lot of money at that. There was a group, uh, I think an IMLS funded group called Pop-Up Archive that had developed some really interesting software uh, for this and had been kind of a niche group, you know, transcribing old uh, public broadcast archives and they got bought by Apple actually uh, for a lot of money because Apple wants the, <laughs> yeah, because Apple wants the technology for Siri. Uh, so I mean, I think you might see some, adv some, adva some advances on this front through you know, just a lot of money being thrown at it. And I will say about the Amazon Transcribe um, 
it seemed it was very good that for it seems like it's even long. It's good if like you've never transcribed before, perhaps yeah. if you don't have a whole lot of experience and all the various like tricks that you learn just for like, getting good at it. But like Jeff and I have both done this before. Jeff especially yeah. is quite good at this, so it was almost faster to just do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the it thing. Up. It's like for you know. Jeff to clean it up. Yeah. Well, yeah, you still you, by you know total. T I'm not sure we saved any total time yeah. from just yeah. if you're an experience if you're at all experienced as a transcriptionist, you probably will still be faster doing it from scratch by start to finish. Yeah. But for you know, intro students doing it for the first time, I can, if, this is really the first time I've thought of sort of saying to students if they wanted to start creating like a, what, we, what the field calls like a dirty transcript, uh, which sounds more interesting than it is, I guess. <laughs> but you know, to use, the, use the, tech, the software to create that transcript and then your time is spent cleaning it up rather than making it from scratch. Uh, you know, the question of whether or not you even transcribe is something oral historians have batted around for a long time. In general, people have made the transcripts, and honestly, when you watch, that's what other historians use when they're in the archive. Uh, there have been some pushes, though, to move away from it. Uh, so, for example, one illustration of that is this software program, the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer. Uh, this is an effort to say, okay, once we have all these big audio and video files, uh, if we could add metadata at pretty granular levels, so down at the level of, say, a five or ten second clip, that would get people to use clips of the original audio more than the transcripts. Because, as you said, Therese, I mean, a lot of people, researchers, like, they know what they're looking for and they get through the, the transcript quickly to try to get to that, and then they might listen to it, but they don't have time to listen to a two-hour interview. And so the idea here is like, well, if you break the whole thing up into clips and then put metadata down to the clip level, uh, you could maybe kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've found it a little clunky in practice. There's another group out of Concordia University in Montreal that's tried something similar. Um, I find these interesting. Uh, they're all open source software projects, which is both good and bad in certain ways, in that they just remain kind of unpolished in a lot of ways, and better in theory than execution in many cases. But, you know, we'll see, I think. Uh, so something to keep an eye out for. Kentucky in particular has uh, a lot of activity in oral history because they have a specific funding stream for oral history written into state law. Uh, for some reason, there was a very prominent politician who loved oral history, and so they have like a permanent, I, I think it comes from some tax money somewhere or something. So University of Kentucky has a standalone state-based oral history project, so they have a ton of great projects there. Uh, and then the final stage gets us to archiving and dissemination, right? Once the interview has been conducted, transcribed, processed, back out to the interviewee to review, all that sort of stuff, it's all set. Then the question is, you know, how do we archive it, this historical, this primary source we've made, and how does it get disseminated? Uh, this question about what gets posted to the web is crucial. Uh, and not just, this isn't just for oral history, but I think all archival digitization efforts face some version of this question. Um, and projects, as I understand, have tried all kinds of different things, right? Do you just post the catalog data up there and say that people have to come in and listen to it? Do you post everything, the transcript, the full audio clip, things like that, and just let people have at it? Um, do you post just the transcript and say people have to listen to the original audio in-house in the archive or something like that? Uh, it used to be the case that the you know, server-side storage uh, limitations meant that there were a few projects that posted sort of full video and audio to everybody on the web, but that has really gone away now too, right? In an era of YouTube and things like that, uh, the ability to have all of it up there online is uh, pretty widely available. But then that raises this control question, right? Uh, a lot of archives get sort of hesitant about, well, if you just sort of release stuff into the wild west of the web and who knows where it goes from there, and we're flooded with all kinds of disinformation and edited clips and things like that. And as we've seen the fruits that that has borne for us in American politics recently. Uh, I think there's still ongoing questions about the long-term preservation formats for audio. Uh, you know, there seems like there's some consensus on like, we'll record in these high, you know, high fidelity wave files and things like that. But you know, what that looks like a decade from now, two decades from now, I think is still up for grabs. And so it's, you know, when you put whatever you put 
in the box or you know, do, you know, do you take the hard drive itself out and store that? Uh, for a lot while people were using various optical storage devices, although those can you know, fail spectacularly as well. Uh, and this isn't particular to digital, right? Magnetic tape collections require a lot of care that is time consuming and expensive and many of them don't get, right? The tapes are supposed to be rewound. I don't know how often, every few years. Every six months, yeah. That's what we do on our Friday nights. Yeah, <laughs> rewind, <laughs> stick your fingers and rewind those tapes, right? Uh, and you know, the cost and time of migrating audio formats uh, is, I think this is you know, something archivists are really starting to get around that like, just the time and cost involved in constantly migrating to whatever the newest format is, is just really intense and labor intensive. And it's tough because I think some outside agencies, including funding agencies, have thought like, well, digital now, so it's saved forever, great, right? We no longer need to pay for the maintenance. Uh, and that obviously is not the case. And I'd include here this question about digitizing old magnetic tape collections uh, as well, as another piece of that kind of migration question that's expensive. A lot of that's been done already. That was a big phase. Yeah. Those yeah. Were yeah. Is the is the SIUE collection all digitized? Yeah. Yeah. I suspect music historians are ahead of the curve on this one, though. So now Yeah. And it is time to Yeah. Um, so I think these are, you know, big questions. Uh, and then finally, I'd say, you know, letting go of control in the web era. It's sort of against our nature as preservation-minded folks, I think, to accept that people are taking the stuff and doing all this stuff with it. That's probably the way it's going to continue to be, and there's some real advantages to that, but it's hard to let go of that kind of authority, right? Um, also, I'd finally say, you know, that there's this tremendous surge in podcasting that's happening, I think, has renewed a lot of interest in oral histories and just audio uh, collections in general. So that's something we'll probably continue to see more of. And in general, I think there's this ongoing problem of plenty, right? That there's so much of this stuff out there that it does raise some really interesting questions about what do we do with all of that? Um, I'll give you an example that I think about a lot, and this is the Veterans History Project, sponsored by the Library of Congress. Just an enormous collection with, a, with thousands and thousands of oral histories from uh, veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, but, you know, I think when I introduce this to students or other educators, it's great in that there's so much there, but at some point it becomes, like, overwhelming. You're like, there's no way into something like this. You're like, what do I even do with this, right? It's just a wall of thousands and thousands of records. And it's like, I guess I start with one at random or something, right? Like, this question of, like, what do we as historians and uh, scholars do with just this massive amount of information that suddenly flooded us in these ways becomes, I think, a real problem that at least historians I know are really grappling with. It's searchable. It's searchable by topic. It is. So but even then, it's like it starts to get so many hits. And this is what I have a quote from Ted Underwood, right? That like in a database containing, containing millions of sentences, full text search can turn up 20 examples of anything. Exactly. Um, so like you know, to those of us who are historians trying to prove or disprove a specific thesis or something like that, it becomes like, do I just cherry pick stuff that proves what I sort of already thought to be true? Do I try and do some sort of more quantitative study, uh, which draws on a whole different set of skills or things like that? So I think this is sort of an issue going in forward. In linguistics, up until recently, archiving wasn't considered scholarship either. The Linguistic Society of America is about to release some guidelines uh, next week, actually, that faculty will be able to bring to their promotion and tenure committees. Oh, mm. well. <laughs> somehow managed to survive anyways. But um, it's kind of showing, you know, uh, how how documentation and archiving is a scholarly pursuit. And, like, here's, you know, here's here are the issues at play, and here's how it feeds. So it's basically considered kind of butterfly collecting, mm -hmm. you know, and, like, kind of not a contribution to the discipline of linguistics and linguistic theory. Yeah. So I think the challenge here is a librarian in information um, yes, it's a starting point, but you have to be able to win all through it. And so just like these databases on the internet, the internet's just got all this vast amount of information. You have to have a way of, of focusing. And so with all this that's becoming available, the challenge for someone is to create a better, more efficient way of 
of searching at various levels yeah. so that you can break it down to more useful mm -hmm. searching. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then also, you know, for those of us who are, you know, also uh, all of us as classroom educators, how to sort of get through that as well, right? How to get students understanding that as well. You know, I can turn them loose in the historic New York Times uh, archive of all the digitized New York Times, which we subscribe to, but to get them to understand, like, how to make sense of that, right? Like, the daily newspaper for a century and a half is just going to turn up so much stuff. Yeah, well, and it becomes a question for the scholars, too, about does that mean we have to reframe our, the questions we're asking in certain ways? Because a lot of questions that we're asking are starting to turn up a lot more than we might have before, or something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a, a wicked problem, as they say, right, in which there is no easy answer. And, sort of, uh, and then I'll just last thing I'll say is I think the question, too, about who pays for this is uh, up for grabs, because all this is time and resource intensive. One answer has been sort of a civic-minded option or paid for by government funds in one way or another. This is a Library of Congress project. Uh, although, you know, those budgets have been austere in recent years. The National Endowment for the Humanities has been on the budgetary chopping block for the past few budget cycles, literally proposed to be eliminated. Um, other groups have tried a, a subscription or pay model. Here, for example, is the History Makers a pretty significant uh, African-American video oral history collection uh, based out of Chicago. And they've got some great interviews, but you got to pay to get access to them. Uh, and they have seen this as, you know, honestly, just a way to make this whole thing sustainable. But I don't know, like, I don't know what the usage of this stuff is. Um, and I know as an educator, too, it's tricky because they have a lot of good sources. But, you know, I just, I can't, I, I do not feel good telling my students that they have to pay out of pocket for another resource or something like that. Uh, to get access to for their for their classes and things like that. Um, so you know whether the future of this looks more like the history makers or more like uh, some Library of Congress project product or some hybrid between them, I don't know. I'm a historian. I only tell what happens in the past. But uh, <laughs> I have no... anyways, I'll wrap up there. Thanks, guys. 